Arsenal, incredible season last year. I know like people like to dig it. Well, what did you win? Doesn't matter. It really was a fantastic season. Before we talk transfers and you know who's going to leave, who's going to come in, Harry. When you look back on last season, do you, do you kind of look back at it like I like I just did? Like regardless of win, I mean it's still incredible to see the way in which you went up another level. Evening, guys. Yeah, for sure, Ade. I mean. It took me a good few weeks to get over the disappointment of not winning the title. I've got to say, like I tried to protect my emotions all the way through. I was constantly <laughs> saying, you know, it's going to be difficult. Don't get your hopes up. But I'd be lying if I said when I got up on that Saturday morning of the final day of the season and made my way down to the Emirates, I wasn't hopeful. And as I say, it took a good two, three weeks, actually. For I wonder me to... where you were on Twitter. <laughs> he was gone, mate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I had to put a little like APB on him. Like, where, where is Harry? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But yeah, it was a, it was a great season, and look, I said that Arsenal needed to win their 18 games in 2024 to win the Premier League title. I said that a few months ago, and they ended up winning 16 of them, drawing one at Manchester City and losing just one, and it still wasn't enough. So I don't really know what it's more. You could trust ask. Me, well, that's the it? answer. When you say don't know what more, the answer is you got to win all 18. Just like you said, trust me, I, I've, been, I've been there as Liverpool fan when. We've had, and that was the best Arsenal squad in years. Yeah. I've been there as a Liverpool fan. We've had the best squad in years, decades, and it still isn't it's enough. It's just not enough. It yeah, must you, be you, hard still you're getting a 90 point barrier, and it's still not enough because mm. City just are relentless. Uh, on the transfer side of things, um, Harry, I want to talk about a couple of players that potentially could go, and these are players that have come through the system. So I guess from an Arsenal fan's perspective, it's even harder. Uh, Emil Smith Rowe and Eddie Nketia. What's your thoughts on both of those? Because again, and Ketch has been linked with moves away for the last couple of seasons now, but you gave him a new contract two years ago. And Emil Smith Rowe, which is unfortunately just been blighted by injuries. Yeah, I think starting with Eddie Nketiah, I think he was given that contract to stop him leaving on a free transfer. Mm. And I think whenever you give somebody a contract in that situation, you're probably going to have to pay them a little bit over the top in terms of wages to convince them that that's the place for them or that you want to keep a hold of them. That's what it feels like Arsenal did with that one. In the first half of last season, he got quite a bit of game time. You know, he was coming off the bench, he was involved, and you thought, you know, maybe, just maybe, there's a future here for Eddie as a, a sort of backup player. Unfortunately for him, when sort of Mikel Arteta discovered that Kai Havertz would do a, a cracking job up front, and that sort of relegated Jesus, who had some injury problems throughout the season, down to number two, that meant a, a lack of game time for Eddie Nketiah. So, I feel like for him, the writing's probably on the wall. I think Arsenal will look at him as a sellable asset, as somebody that they could raise funds through. And I think he will probably move on this summer. And I think that's not just best for Arsenal, but it's best for him as well. Because he's at an age now, Eddie Nketiah, where he needs to be playing. I think he's a Premier League level striker. I'm not sure exactly where he falls in terms of the club hierarchy. But I think if I were... It's certainly in the bottom half of the Premier League, I'd Fulham. look at him as a decent option. I think there's so many options. You said Fulham, I think. Everton. I think West Ham. West Ham. West Ham. Yeah. It's just Antonio up front, really, isn't it? I mean, there's so much movement. Palace fans him. would say no because of Mateta's doing really well now, but yeah. like, I would have said uh, like One a thing, I, the fact that we've just named four or five teams there suggests there are options. Absolutely. Wolves. In the Premier League. Wolves. It's so, yeah. Yeah, it's so much. Um, what about Emil Smith Rowe then? Because there was a time, and we were just talking about it before we came on, like him and Saka were neck and neck. And it felt like that's it, right? You got you got the right side of play, you got the left side of play. And some were saying he was better than Saka for yeah, a period. The song goes that Saka and Emma Smith Rowe, they're in the yeah. same song. That's, and that's all of a sudden, it. with Martinelli, with Trossard being so fantastic since that move from Brighton, he's fell well down the pecking order. Yeah, he has. Obviously, injuries have played a massive part in him struggling. But also, I, I just don't see where he fits anymore. Um, and I don't mean that disrespectfully. I think he's a, a really top talent. But for me, his best position is probably in the hole behind the forward as a 10. And Arsenal just don't play with a 10 anymore. So the team's developed and evolved into a completely different system and different shape. And unfortunately, he's been left behind. People keep saying that, you know, last season he should have got more game time, more opportunities. But again, I'll, I'll ask that same question. Where do you fit him in? And mm -hmm. it's it's harsh and it's unfair. And I think a lot of Arsenal fans give Emile Smith-Rowe a lot more leeway than they would other players because he is a Hayland Academy graduate, because he came through and looked really exciting along with Bukayo Saka. But the truth is, I don't think there's a place for him at the club anymore. And again, you know, we, we keep talking about PSR. It's all we talk about. I don't think Arsenal are in a position, by the way, like a lot of other clubs where they're desperate to sell and, you know, where they're sort of really close to the red line. But I think Emile Smith-Rowe is, again, someone they'll look at and think we can raise money through his sale. 
And again, a bit like Eddie and Ketty, I know I sound like I'm saying the same thing over and over again, but for him, the move needs to happen mm -hmm. because he cannot be a bit part player like he was again, you know, this season where he barely played any football. Um, it, 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 he's just too big of a talent to, mm -hmm. to see him sit there and, and rot. Now, I think some people have tried over the course of this season that's just finished to try and justify him as being a number eight. You know, but that's not that's not the truth. That's not what no. Emil Smith Rowe is. That's people trying to find a way to work him into this system because they like him. But if you want to be the very best, if you want to compete with the elite, sometimes you have to be ruthless. Arsenal have not been very good at selling in recent years, but now we're in a really strong position with a group of players that I think are sellable assets that you could raise money from. And I think Arsenal need to take that opportunity because since KSE took full control of the club and, and really started to back the Mikel Arteta project. It has been spend, 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 spend every single summer. And the truth is not a lot of money's come in the other way. At mm. some point, that balance is going to need to be yeah. addressed. And I think that it starts this summer with yeah. the likes of Smith Rowe, with the likes of Eddie Nketiah, probably people like Reese Nelson too, and maybe a few others you could put on the list. Yeah, especially when it comes to, like you said, academy prospects where, uh, sorry, academy um, players who... We give you 100% profit. In terms of closing this gap now, Harry, with Manchester City and assuming that it's it's you two again, you know, Liverpool got a new manager, so you're not sure if they're going to be able to be up there again. Let's just assume that it's still you, second in command. In January, I know a lot of Arsenal fans were saying, you know, we must get a striker, a number nine. We need that goal scorer. Kai Havertz, like you said, glowingly, like he, he's done really well. Don't think they need one anymore. Do do they do they need that Harry? And if not, or if they do, also what are the pri what are the priority areas? I mean, Timber's going to be like a new sign in anyway. Um, what are the priorities for Arsenal to close this gap to Manchester City? So, in answer to the first question about whether or not they need a striker, I don't think at any point over the last two seasons you can look back and say that Arsenal's problem was a lack of goals, and that's why I remember being on here before. Um, not with you guys, but with with some other presenters and getting into sort of arguments about mm. whether or not Arsenal need a centre forward. They scored a record number of goals last season in the Premier League. So, you know, they, they don't need that desperately. It would be nice to have a different option up front, I think. But that is more of a luxury than something that they're desperate for this summer. In terms of the priority areas, I think I've got a good idea of what Mikel Arteta will be looking at. I think on his radar would be a specialist left back. You mentioned Jurian Timber, who will come back, and I'm sure he would have played a lot of football at left back yeah. last season had he been fit. But even he is not a specialist left back. You're still talking about a centre back slash right back playing on the wrong side. I think that Zinchenko, who's another option, is not a specialist left back either. So I think that's what he's looking at. I think the midfield is the most complex situation that he has to deal with this summer because there are going to be departures. We know that El Nenny's gone. Um, you know, I'm not saying that El Nenny was was ever going to be a part of the plans next season, but with him going, with so much speculation about Thomas Partey maybe going, um, you know, you need to address that. They've given Jorginho a contract extension, which suggests he'll be part Makes of sense. the plan. But yeah. are, are we in a place now where you look at Thomas Partey and you just say enough is enough? We can't go into yeah. another season carrying him and his injuries. And if that's the case, you need to bring in someone else. Where does he see Declan Rice playing? Because in the second half of the season, he tried to use him a lot more as an eight. In the first half, he played as a six. And depending on what Arteta's view is on Rice, I think that will determine what type of profile he goes for in midfield. And I think Arsenal want a forward, but I don't think they're married to the idea of it being a centre forward. I think they'd be happy to add a winger that can score goals as well if that opportunity presents itself. We've Someone on the right side, Harry, you know, it's Saka being run into the ground, very rarely gets a rest. There's no obvious player to sort of come in and come on the right. Is that when you say a forward? Someone who can, you know, like what Trossard can do. You know what, though? That's so difficult, isn't it? Like, yeah. Trossard's perfect, by yeah. the way, because he's happy to come off the bench. But if you are a player, yeah. and a bit like Harry Kane Tottenham issue, how do you do how, that? How do you want to come to a club where you know Saka is going to play 99.9% exactly. .9 of the games? It's yeah, so difficult it is. to find those players that are happy to come off the bench. It reduces the pool of players available to you, right? Because what you're essentially saying is if you come in, you're going to play second fiddle. So the very best are not going to want to come. Mm. So I think you need to find someone that can play in a variety of roles across that front line and just you know, give them the indication that they're going to get enough game time. And I think, look, the Champions League format's different next season. you got extra games in that. Um, you know, Arsenal need to go stronger in the domestic cups. That's been the one criticism of this Arsenal team. 
I would have over the last few years. They've been unlucky with draws, but it's not an excuse. You need to be competitive in those competitions. So you need more players. Um, as I say, I think they'll get a forward. I'm not sure it's going to be a centre forward, though. I think it could be a right-sided winger. We heard loads about Benjamin Sesko, didn't we, over the last couple of weeks. That's not going to happen now. He's going to stay at RB Leipzig. And that what that says to me is that Arsenal are still open-minded about the type of forward that they're going to get. Um, you know, they, there were suggestions that they were really far down the line with this. Obviously, that's a load of nonsense because that's not materialised into anything. But it also says to me that they're not going to be rushed into doing something for the sake of it. All we kept hearing was that deal needed to be done by the end of this week because of the Euros and the release clause that runs out in <laughs> Always June. Always happens in the transfers. Yeah, yeah exactly. Like, then they're, they're not in a rush. They're going to bide their time in the forward situation. But we did hear recently that Mikel Arteta in the hierarchy believe that maybe there's a bit of X factor missing from that front line. So I think to close the gap, that's probably the biggest issue they need to address. Another option in attack. On AM, on DAB, via the TalkSport app and on your smart speaker. TalkSport.